Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Frank Doyle, and uh, Frank is an attorney and founder of Wealth Plan, a law firm specializing in estate planning, estate and trust administration, and estate and trust litigation. He's been practicing law for about 37 years and is certified by the California State Bar as a specialist in taxation law and probate, estate planning, and trust law. Thank Frank, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, yeah. Michael. Great. Now, um, today Frank and I are going to be talking about elder abuse issues in estate planning. And uh, before we get started, I want to caution our viewers that uh, this is actually a, a fairly big area. It's a developing area, sort of a, a new area a in new some area, ways. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in uh, the estate and, and gift area and so forth, and mostly care giving. Anyway, we're covering uh, a few highlights of a really big area, and uh, the rules also vary from state to state, and particularly the, this in this particular area. Uh, so you need to get qualified help, and in this case, uh, get good legal counsel we're focusing on California law. Frank is a California attorney. I'm a California CPA. And uh, the rules uh, vary somewhat, as we say, for the other states. So be aware of that. So Frank, why is elder abuse suddenly a concern in the estate planning process? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of the, uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first is that, uh, for years, there's been a lot of uh, mm -hmm. elder abuse that went undetected. Uh -huh. I think, uh, and when we're, t we're looking at elder abuse, uh, I think there's a, a recognition in the law, and I think a recognition in society, that there's certainly physical abuse mm -hmm. of an elder, which you know is easy to detect, and uh, there are you know criminal uh, penalties and enhancements that go along with any type of physical abuse. But there's also the more subtle uh, emotional abuse and financial abuse. And mm -hmm. I think that's what uh, the law is, uh, you know, is, is, is addressing, and that's what's, uh, what's changed. And the elder abuse rules uh, apply to everyone. In other words, I think cer certainly uh, uh, many times certain family members think they're exempt from these rules. Uh, and they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the if you uh, you know if a child takes money wrongfully from a uh, you know an elder's account, uh, they've committed elder abuse. Mm -hmm. And there are criminal sanctions. There are uh, you know incredible civil enhancements. For, for example, um, if you had a uh, you know this this happens quite. You know, more often than we'd like to think. You know, uh, mom gets elderly uh, in, into her 80s. Uh, you know, one of her children, let's say it's a son, uh, who is, uh, you know, late 50s. Let's say he hasn't fared so well in life. So uh, he comes back to live with mom. And, uh, you know, he's not employed. Maybe he has a substance abuse problem. Uh, and so, uh, you know, he gets himself put on mom's account, and uh, away goes fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. All right, that's elder abuse. Uh -huh. Okay, that's financial, you know, elder abuse. Um, and uh, the the cost of doing that would be, first of all, <coughs> the law provides that. Um, he could lose his inheritance because uh, from a, a, a legal point of view, he's put on the same plane as someone who, uh, a slayer who had killed the mom and mm -hmm. therefore could inherit. Mm -hmm. So he's put on that plane. The second thing is he could be held responsible for, you know, when the other children find out and they go get a conservator appointed so mom's protected and her assets are, uh, uh, you know, put under court supervision. He's responsible for all those uh, costs, including attorney's fees. He's included, he's responsible for any attorney's fees uh, 
you know, uh, the, that are incurred, and he has to pay back, um, you know, treble damages. Mm -hmm. So, so, so he's got to pay not only the fifty thousand back, but one hundred fifty thousand back. Mm -hmm. So you can see how the elder abuse can be financially uh, ruinous, and it's designed to be financially ruinous to people who commit it. And I think uh, so many times. In the, is in the when you have estate disputes, um, and there has been some uh, so-called what, of course he's going to claim is lifetime giving. You know, mom wanted me to have this fifty thousand dollars because you know I was living here, I was taking care of her, uh, I was driving her to the doctors. You know, uh, uh, she wanted me to have the fifty thousand uh, dollars, so that's going to be his position, and of course the other siblings who are very upset that he's taken the fifty thousand dollars from mom uh, basically have the elder abuse uh, rules to, uh, to be a real club that mm -hmm. uh, you know can financially uh, uh, be devastating you know to to the child so that's a very typical s uh, scenario that we see and uh, there's a lot of incentive to make um, you know the elder abuse allegations because uh, you know the, of the uh, enhancements, particularly the fact that you know the attorney's fees, uh, the, the uh, elder abuser is going to be responsible for the uh, for the uh, you know for the uh, attorney's fees. So it's a it's a real um, developing area. It's an area that. Uh, you have to counsel, be careful to counsel your clients to avoid, mm -hmm. and you have to be able to uh, understand that if you know if you do have an elder abuse claim in a situation, if you are representing, for example, the siblings of the uh, uh, you know the siblings uh, that are trying to get mom's money back, that you know a very potent weapon. Uh, legally that you have is the elder abuse claims. Okay. Now, um, I think one thing that we can frame this as, uh, and the reason why it's become more and more of an issue, is sort of the aging of America oh, and, 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 and the extension of our life expectancy. So back in the 20s and 30s, you know, people were passing away shortly after getting into Social Security age. Uh, uh, you know, when it started becoming available, and and we're seeing the problems, you know, with Social Security now. But we've also seen, you know, uh, for example, Alzheimer's is a concern, where it was something that you didn't see all that often. It didn't wasn't f framed as as much of a society problem. Now, you know, it's it's widespread. Correct. And and a big part of it again is people are living longer, so now they're be becoming subject to suffering from the disease. Um, anyway, so maybe we can talk a little bit about how this developed. And again, who are the people that sort of get themselves in this position? So, so how did? What were some of the early cases? Uh, well, I think there was. Uh, you know, I've I've seen the uh, the Gray Panthers, for example, uh, have <laughs> been in, in uh, you know ARP and a lot of senior uh, groups have been very aggressive in getting protective legislation. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you say, people are living longer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that means that there's probably, uh, you know, a, a very good chance that, uh, you know, as uh, our generation, you know, ages, that we're going to have a period of time where we are going to be uh, not have 100% uh, capacity, mm -hmm. uh, or be have called what we call diminished capacity, uh -huh. or be frail, or be susceptible to uh, undue to, influence, to, to undue influence, etc. And so, uh, and and what the law, the way it's evolving, is uh, it is evolving so that if you, for example. Uh, you know, commit undue influence in the estate planning context, that's viewed as elder abuse. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, there are cases that say the elder abuse claims survive death. So, for example, if the son who's living with the mom takes the, the mom to his attorney and mom changes the estate plan uh, where you know he ends up getting uh, all of the assets and it turns out that he has in fact committed undue influence uh, then you know that's uh, that uh, exposes him to an elder abuse claim mm -hmm. and I think that's uh, you know that's a nuance in estate planning that the attorneys have to be aware of because guess what the law is written in rather draconian fashion where it not only gets the uh, the son but it also gets the professional typically the attorney who's who uh, is drafted the document and uh, is going to be viewed as an aid you know aiding and abetting the elder abuse and that's where I think uh, a lot of practitioners are uh, are unaware of the stakes mm -hmm. and, and and so that's something that practitioners have to be very very careful about uh, you know when you have that situation you know you we all want clients but you know we get the call and uh, you know it's typically the son and he says mom wants her will changed and you say would you come talk to mom well mom judge you know doesn't you know she's mm -hmm. <laughs> she's asleep right now or, or whatever uh, but I'm going to bring her, you know, bring her by, and you don't exercise uh, some kind of due diligence, then you could certainly be, uh, uh, you know, accused of aiding and abetting elder abuse. And mm -hmm. if you fall into that category, you could be the deep pocket. Because remember, the son, if he really is in the position that I described, doesn't have any assets. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, he's got nothing to lose. Yeah. At least currently. But the attorney, you know, is going to be accused of not exercising due diligence uh, and, uh, and aiding and abetting the elder abuse. So you have to be very, very careful when you're in that situation. So who are some people that are subject to this by their position? So uh, I guess we call these people fiduciary positions? Yeah, and I think that goes to the attorneys, mm -hmm. obviously, who are they're going to be drafting the documents. I think financial planners, mm -hmm. you know, who uh, you know are you know working with a family, and uh, you know, and, and it, this this can happen very innocuously. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have a financial planner, and he can be working with the son, who now let's change the facts a little bit, and he's inordinately successful. Mm -hmm. And the financial planner, you know, wants to keep the son happy, mm -hmm. and the son basically says, you know what, one thing, I don't approve of the way my sister's conducting herself, and, uh, you know, I'm going to work to get the, my sister cut out of mom's will. And it has nothing to do with what he wants the money, he just wants to be vindictive against the, sis the sister. Well, that's undue influence. Mm -hmm. That's a form of elder abuse. Mm -hmm. You know, and the attorney or the financial planner that wants to keep, you know, a big, big client happy could wander... Uh, you know, unwittingly into the jaws of an elder abuse claim. How about bankers? Well, bankers are, um, they, they've been the ones uh, that have uh, been the most vulnerable. But there's a couple cases just, uh, I think, last year that came down that basically said that, um, you know, bankers don't have a huge... Uh, duty to uh, scrutinize the capacity of uh, their customers. They're not in that position. So, uh, uh, but I think most banks are, are very careful when they see an elder and they see some movement of cash uh, or some, uh, you know, somebody's being, uh, you know, put on an account, particularly a stranger. Um, I think uh, the, uh, the antenna go up with the bankers. Uh, but bankers, again, yeah, they're in a, they've been in a position, and they've been actually sued, uh, mm -hmm. maybe more than any other profession, mm -hmm. uh, for allowing you know people uh, uh, to rip off elders in uh, scams that involve their bank accounts. Yeah, you know, but uh, uh, so they are definitely uh, targets as well.
How about care custodians? Well, care custodians are, uh, that's where a lot of the focus of the law has been uh, it really aimed uh, directly at uh, care custodians. In the estate planning area, we have a, uh, you know, a section called uh, 21360 of the uh, probate code, and there's a presumption that if you make a gift to your care custodian, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the product of undue influence. I mean, th there's a presumption that can only be overcome by clear and convincing evidence, which is a much higher standard than the normal uh, standard. So the, the law is really weighted against uh, care custodians being uh, beneficiaries. And though there are important exceptions to that mm -hmm. rule, you mm -hmm. know, there are ways uh, that, uh, and procedures that you can use to, uh, to uh, have a care custodian get a gift. Mm -hmm. But those, um, but those are uh, have to be adhered to, and if they're not adhered to, then uh, then the uh, you know any gift to a care custodian is going to be uh, viewed as uh, the product of uh, undue influence. And there have been a lot of horror stories that have that have uh, resulted in the law being uh, so uh, tilted against care custodians. And that is, you know, the care custodian moves in, isolates the um, you know, because what happens in many situations is the elder wants to stay at home. Yes. And when you think of yourself, you know, you want to stay at home. The idea of having to go to a, a convalescent hospital or a nursing home is abhorrent, okay? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is the family tries to accommodate that. Then they get a care custodian in, involved. And then the care custodian controls the, uh, the elder by mm -hmm. saying, well, you know, I'm really your last, you know, uh, rope, so to speak. Uh, I'm, I'm the only thing that stands between you and the convalescent hospital. And then, uh, and by the way, your children have all, you know, uh, said, you know, that they really want you in the nursing home. And if you don't, uh, you know, give me a substantial gift in your will, uh, I'm going to quit. And if I quit, you know, you're going to be uh, put in a in a uh, in a convalescent facility. So, those are the things that uh, where real abuses happen. And I, I frankly have been shocked that those cases are uh, more frequent than I would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I first heard about these cases, I was very very skeptical and said, well, those are just really really rare. But uh, you know, over the course of uh, dealing with a lot of elders. Uh, I find uh, find that these kind of situations are uh, uh, are not that atypical. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to follow your thought a little bit. And what is required if somebody does want to make a gift to, say, one of these fiduciaries or or whatever, or uh, to the care custodian? What, what would be required well, in order to make it legitimate? Well, there's a, there's a uh, certificate of independent review that has to be done, okay? And, uh, you know, the, the law has recently changed that in the case of a care custodian, uh, you know, the uh, elder's attorney can actually, that does their normal estate planning, can actually issue the certificate. Mm -hmm. And that's good because I had occasions under prior law where, um, I, you know, I've got to have this client for 20 years. Uh -huh, uh -huh. All right, he basically <coughs> wants to <coughs> make a gift, uh, a cash gift to the care custodian that's, you know, taken good care of, uh, of himself, you know, for, let's say, five years. Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't, in the old law, I couldn't, I'd have to refer him to an independent attorney whose sole job was to vet him and make sure that uh, he, you know, he really wanted to do this. Mm -hmm. Now I can issue the certificate, okay? Oh. But I have to be sure that he's got capacity, mm -hmm. real sure, and then I've got to vet him and make sure this is uh, he's not operating under any uh, undue influence, and uh, you know, and so I'm putting you know myself on the line in right. a sense, uh, and I've got to have a, a verification. Of those uh, of those facts, if you're dealing with gifts to an attorney, mm -hmm. or you're dealing with gifts to a fiduciary, mm -hmm. you have to get a, a completely independent attorney. 
Okay. Okay. And I think that makes that makes sense in those situations. Mm -hmm. But if you're making a gift to a, um, a care custodian, you have to uh, either get a certificate of independent review, um, and as I say, the the uh, the long you know, like in my case, my the, I was the attorney for my client. I didn't had never met the caregiver, had never no you know relationship, financial or otherwise with the at all with the caregiver. Uh, so I was in a position to once I was convinced of my client at capacity and was not operating under influence, I uh, was able to issue the certificate. Okay. Who's an independent attorney? <laughs> well, an independent attorney is somebody who has, uh, it used to be there were three requirements. Mm -hmm. And in, except in the case that I just described, there still are three requirements. And the first requirement is that your sole job is to uh, determine whether this particular gift uh, is being done uh, in a situation where the client has capacity and is not operating on any undue influence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one number one. Number two is you can't have any relationship, financial, uh, you know, familial, or otherwise, with the uh, care custodian that's going to be this, the uh, getting the gift. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the uh, the, the uh, third thing you have to do is you have to vet the client to make sure that they've got capacity, and they've got uh, and they're not operating under undue influence. Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are the three. Uh, requirements and uh, the only one that's been relaxed uh, in the situation with the care custodian is the uh, the one that says that your sole duty is to your sole engagement is to uh, make that determination. And I think that makes sense, you know, as, as, as part of the uh, so I as part of the overall estate planning process. As long as I have no relationship with the uh, the care custodian and I'm convinced that my client has capacity. And uh, uh, is not operating under undue influence. I can issue the certificate. Okay, what kinds of transactions are covered? <clears throat> Any kind of gift transaction, whether it's an inter vivos gift, a gift by a will, a gift in a living trust, uh, you know, any testamentary or lifetime gift, any donative transaction. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so what a lot of times people try to do, you know, we say, oh well, this is compensation. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, the way you've uh, we've been able to find out whether it uh, is compensation or not is simply to say, well, uh, you know, let me see your tax return. Mm -hmm. And if they report it on their tax return, then they've got, you know, and it's reasonable, you know, maybe maybe it's uh, maybe it is. Mm -hmm. But if it's not reported on the tax return, and it's a large amount that's disproportionate to their compensation, then it, then it wouldn't be. What about being named an executor or a trustee? Well, if you're an executor or a trustee, I think um, you're in a fiduciary position. Okay, and if you're, let's say, successor trustee to mom's living trust, your mom gets up there to be 85, you're the su successor trustee. Once you get put on as the successor trustee, you're in a position where uh, you're in a fiduciary position and any gifts to you will be scrutinized. Now, one of the things that this, you know, 21360, this what we call statutory undue influence, it doesn't apply to family members. Mm -hmm. But remember, family members are subject to the elder abuse law. Mm -hmm. You know, family members are subject to the ordinary principles of undue influence mm -hmm. and, uh, and capacity. And so, in those rules, if you are a fiduciary, the burden of proof tilts to you. In other words, you have to show that any gift that you received during the period where you were a trustee or an executive, executor was uh, was not obtained by undue influence, and uh, and uh, so the burden of proof is is uh, is on you. What if uh, the elder wants to name a, a caregiver as their executor or trustee? They got an independent review. So, so sort of back review. to independent review. Yeah. Okay. Same with an attorney. A lot of times, uh, you know, people will want to name an attorney as the uh, as the executor or the accountant. Mm -hmm. You know, as a as a trustee. Mm -hmm. And you have to look and you have to see. Okay, is the is the accountant? Uh, uh, you know, is is the is there undue influence in those situations? 
So uh, with an attorney, if you're the drafting attorney, you mm -hmm. know, you're, uh, there's automatically a presumption that you obtained your position by undue influence. Okay, if you're the CPA, there's no um, statutory presumption generally, mm -hmm. but there is, again, uh, you're in a fiduciary position to your client, and uh, so the, the um, you know, your, your position is scrutinized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're probably getting to the last couple minutes here. Maybe you can throw out some final thoughts of wisdom or if we missed any, you know, major points. Well, I think the whole elder abuse area is, uh, it's an emerging area of law. Uh, it's, uh, in the words of W.C. Fields, it's fraught with eminent peril <laughs> for the professionals. Uh, and so when you're dealing with an, with an elder, uh, I think, you know, as a professional, as a, as a lawyer, uh, or as a financial planner, or as an accountant, uh, you have to uh, be aware mm -hmm. that uh, the older abuse rules are, uh, you know, are in play. And so, like, if the accountant saw, um, you know, saw some funny transactions when they were reviewing the bank account, uh, you know, the question is, you know, uh, what action do you have to take? You know, do you uh, do you have to bring it to attention to somebody? And you know, if you saw that fifty thousand dollars go out of the account, you know, what duty of inquiry do you uh, do you have? The attorney the same way. Mm -hmm. And it's an emerging area of law. And the and the, the wisdom is be very conservative, and uh, err on the side of uh, of uh, protecting the elder and uh, and uh, and uh, sometimes that's not as easy as you think. Okay. Frank, thanks for joining me. Thank you. It's all We're all out of time. Okay. okay, folks. Well, I hope we've given you some things to think about, and we'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly.